Thank you very much. Our final speaker today is uh, Professor Leslie Green, who convenes the Environmental Humanities South, South Research and Teaching Initiative at the University of Cape Town. Um, her work explores the intersection of science studies, environment, law, and philosophy. And an example of this, I think, or illustrative of this, is a research in graduate supervision, which spans such subjects as fisheries policy, fracking, baboon human interactions, <coughs> lobster ecology, rhino conservation, and plant medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And you know, I think what's wonderful about an event like this is to be able to have the privilege of the support of a museum as important as is ECO in such a critical issue. Um, so I, I wanted to say thank you so much to, to all of you for so sort of patiently through all these presentations which have been saying such extraordinary things. Um, and, and to Deborah and her team for just putting together an incredible array. This is one of the first events that I've been to that's a public event where such a broad sector of, of presentation has been able to be made. So, you know, I, I teach uh, and, 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 w and work in an in a initiative that um, gives me a lot of hope, in fact, working with students who are grappling with the kinds of issues that we're grappling with today. I think the bottom line here is that we are probably all here because we feel a sense of crisis and we feel a sense of disempowerment and seeing something that is so important to us at risk and at such grave risk. So what the environmental humanities does as a, as a sphere of work is, is try to, to move beyond the environmental sciences, um, to work very closely with scientists, but also to be able to open up the questions along different tracks. How do we think about meaning? How do we think about the relationships that make the world? So let me just try to set out quickly what, what we, how we try to approach um, the, the, the tremendous environmental challenges from an environment humanities perspective. Mm -hmm. Our starting point is that the world is made in relationships, relationships of all kinds. And I think that's what, what's so important in that is, is we move beyond thinking of a world as, as a collection of things. But what are the active, ongoing relationships and how are they making the world? Um, across multiple species, across molecules, and crucially, thinking about meaning as well. So in the environment humanities, what we're trying to do is, 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 is not take necessarily as, as face value, take as given a particular version of nature. Because there are many different versions of nature. I remember living in Gertrude a couple of years ago and encountering um, a, a well-known vineyard owner and farmer who was responsible for, for um, kale and mine, who was in, as luck had it, ended up becoming my neighbor. I bought a tiny property next to the farm for a while. And also encountering um, people in, in Gertrude under the name of, of, of green activism who were playing out an incredibly conservative politics and, and uh, kind of a conservatism. And that in many ways has initiated a process of thinking for me. How is it that people can come to make the landscape in such very different ways, imagine the landscape, and respond to it in such very different ways? Um, and how is it that in South Africa, uh, the green lobby is so overwhelmingly racialized? Um, how is it that we haven't got trade unions on board? The beginnings, for example, of involvement with, sort of with NAMSA, um, on, 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 on beginning to oppose um, nuclear interventions, for example. But what, is, what are the large issues that are going on around environmental activism that make environmental activism so problematically set in opposition to development in South Africa? And what is it that about those discussions and, and ways of thinking about the landscape that is disempowering those who are wanting to speak, who are wanting to demean, who are wanting to say, stop, um, and there's, there's a different way to do this. How do we have those kinds of conversations? And one of the things that I wanted to, to, to highlight here today is that the question for so many scientists is we must just do the science. And yet, uh, for a philosopher of science in Belgium who will be our guest in a few weeks' time, is Phil Stengers, what is so critical for universities and for sciences in our time is to pull ourselves and pull our ways of thinking, to disaggregate our thinking from the logics of the knowledge economy, the logics of capital. She's this philosopher of science who's published with the Nobel Prize winner of, of chemistry in the Friedrich Union a few years ago, many years ago now. <coughs> but she's, she herself is a scientist and a philosopher of scientists, but she speaks of capitalist sorcery, the takeover of science, the takeover mm -hmm. of rationality.
personalities that take over logics. And it's in that kind of space, working with the connections of, between multiple species, the, the disruption of the flows of molecules around our planet that characterize our time, and the meanings that allow that to happen, that is, is, is where we're trying to work. Trying to expand also beyond just the now, which is one of the ways in which the knowledge economy, the logics of capital, this capitalist sorcery, as Isabel described it, the ways in which those logics just close us in to our time as if this is the only time the planet has ever had. And as if we can make environmental regulatory decisions reasonably, logically, and rationally when we're dealing with matters of permanence. I'm astonished to see the ways in which in nuclear, nuclear bank has been built to store nuclear waste for 115,000 years. Egyptian pyramids are 5,000 years old. The Neanderthals died out 39,000 years ago. Multiply that by almost three. We're thinking future species of humanity. And as my colleague in Hedley Tidal pointed out, one of the questions that those makers of these concrete bunkers have had to put on the table is how do we create signage mm. for future humans <laughs> <laughs> that will mean danger? Mm. Keep out. Because we don't know what languages they're going to be speaking. Are we dealing with cyborgs? What species are we going to be dealing with? We don't know. And that's nuclear. Fracking. Nuclear's got a, a lifespan in terms of radiation. You know, it's a point at which radiation is depleted and it can presumably go on. Tell that to Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. um, with fracking, we're dealing with pyramids. When you're dealing with a crew aquifer that's a fossil aquifer, we're not even dealing in scales of 100,000 years dealing with much older sources of water. We're dealing with fossil water. The extraordinary thing about fracking is that we're trying to release energy that was stored by the sun 250, 300 million years ago as the carboniferous, the plants that had evolved in, in that particular moment of, of the Earth's history um, became part of the, the geology of the Earth. We're busy extracting the sun's energy from 300 million years ago, and yet the Karoo is one of the world's best spaces for solar energy. I will footnote there that solar energy projects and wind energy projects have got their own issues that we need to think about. But I think we can address those. But one of my questions is, um, how does a landscape like this, this is a <coughs> piece of the tankwa um, tree, <coughs> sandbox tankwa, which um, I find so raw and beautiful, how does, how does that relate to that picture of the, of the Karoo, the installation down here in this building? from 260 million years ago. Thank you, Roger, for such a fascinating. Uh, I've always been fascinated by the Karoo's history and the, this idea that, that, that actually mammals, the rise of mammals, the shift from reptiles to mammals happened here. Um, how did that happen? How did the Karoo get from lush forests to, to dry to the den? Um, to not go over the ground that's already been much more heavily gone over. Let me just quickly take you back to the the Pangaea supercontinent, about 400 million years ago, Roger, you can correct me on the details. <laughs> um, the Pangaea supercontinent, where we had um, all the, the major continents together, there's this, plot, this m massive moment in the Earth about 400 million years ago where there's uh, an uh, extraordinary flowering of plants globally. Plant evolution, and this, this, this rapid rise of plants absorbs so much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I can't improve my relationship. It's so much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that the Earth loses its greenhouse roof. It gets very, very cold. So observe here the connection between plants and atmosphere and Earth temperature. Um, and that leads to what, in fact, became known as the Global Karoo Ice Age. So I don't quite know why it was known as the Karoo Ice Age. But <coughs> and at that time, the Karoo Ice Cap was, was kilometers deep. In some places, I've seen some material, some research that has suggested in some places the Karoo Ice Cap was about um, five to seven kilometers thick, some particular places too. Yeah. And then this curious, extraordinary thing happens in response to all this massive availability of plant matter, the termites evolve. Um, and what termites do, obviously chop away wood, but what they do in their bellies is convert that wood to methane, the good old fart. Hard to do for offending anyone. But, uh, you can imagine this species, uh, you know, now methane, which is <coughs> one of the, the, the emissions of, 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 of fracking processes. Um, methane has got a massive, massively much more significant greenhouse gas effect than carbon dioxide. And so over 100 million years or so, the, 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 the work of these evolving termites, some of which are very big, some of which are smaller, um, 
restore that greenhouse re roof to the earth and earth forms. So look, my, I'm not a paleontologist, but what's so fascinating to look at the, the, the history of the Peru in relation to particular species, plants, and then, and then, and then these, these insects, these termites. The fascinating, fascinating research going on at Blomkenthal um, Museum in, in relation to termite moss in the Peru. So, and, and by the way, what's fascinating to me is that at that time, as that as ice cap thins down, as that ice cap thins down, the earth starts to spring back up and, and all sorts of volcanoes begin to, to, to evolve. To, you know, this, 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 and much of what you're seeing in, in Greenland at the moment, some of the scientists are, are arguing that, um, that because of the thinning of the ice cap in Greenland right now, the earth's crust is beginning to spring up, so we're getting much more volcanic activity. So it's a story then that the Kuru for us is, is a story of molecules, the species that exchange them, the effects of their, of their practices, what they do. Um, what are the implications for humans? And I'm so glad that, that Nathan, honey, wave your hand, Nathan. <laughs> Nathan has done so much to, 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 uh, to make people aware through this extraordinary installation, the subterrifuge in, 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 in the Tukwa, uh, to make people aware and make people think about um, the impact of, potential impact of, of fracking on the Karoo. And Issa, all of, all of those, those objects in Africa, and I think they've conscientized people and begun to, to build an environmental public in an extraordinary way. Um, uh, so, you know, to try not say too much of what, what's been said before, that's also from their site um, of, of how they got to that word, which Virginia, Virginia was speaking about. These installations speak to me of the cosmology of our times. They, they remind me of the Kukuru graveyards with those big cedars, they remind, us of this, remind me of steeples and churches, and they remind me most of all of, of they make me think of the connection between earth and sky, and what we do when we think about cosmology. Um, any idea what that is? It looks like a microchip. It's a farmland in Idaho that's being prepped. Zoom out. It looks like that. Cancer South Africa issued a statement at the press conference in February this year, arguing that of the 750 chemicals used in fracking, 150 are carcinogens. So for that reason, they took a principled stand against fracking. Um, that leads out, because cancer South Africa is obviously interested in carcinogens, that leads out the endocrine disruptors, that leads out the neurological chemicals. And all the other kinds of chemicals that cause different kinds of harm to different kinds of species. The practice, I thought that was very really right, right it. <laughs> the practice of displacing molecules at this scale is only possible if there's a logic that says it's okay. How do we disrupt that logic? is the question. And I think this is where the, the, the space becomes so powerful for artists and scientists to work together, to question the logics of capital, to question the logics that enable such enormous processes to get underway in farmland. How do you disrupt your farmland? California is in the worst, worst crisis in, ever known, water, water crisis, and their, three of their major aquifer systems have been polluted by fracking. They can't use their water, the aquifer water. So I wanted to think very quickly about the, the, just a, a particular thing called cement that's so much part of our time. One of the, the interesting things is that environmental regulation is possible because of the assurances of cement makers that they can create a cement that will be strong enough to line the wells up that so that there won't be any leakages from the wastewater sites or from the wells themselves. Those wells, some of which are going to be going down five kilometers, imagine five table mountains, one on top of the other. And then imagine the pressure on those pipes, five SUVs on your fingertip is the amount of pressure to any of you have a house that doesn't have a crack. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these, are, these are logics that are impossible and we need to call those logics for what they are. Um, there's a logic in this, in, 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 it's at work in environmental regulation that is inappropriate to the time frame of what we're doing. We're dealing with permanence. Cement is not permanent. But if any of the fences down in, in, in the Cape Point, where you see the fences that were built during World War II, the, the, the World War II installations that 50, 60, 70 years ago, they're all cracking, they're all falling apart, they're all imploding. The chemistry of cement is not adequate to the task of what we're trying to do. So, <coughs> What I want to leave you with is this thought that there's this modernist belief in the power of cement that enables us to become
from our own being stripped mm -hmm. of Israel. And I think that's the point at which we are able to have an effect, and it's a combination of arts, mm -hmm. scientists, and philosophy, thinking about law, thinking about who we are on this planet. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.